Hi, and this is Mushtaba al Hello, I'm, I'm your instructor in the course of literary criticism. In fact, this is a very introductory course that uh, covers the most important theories and schools or movements in, in literary criticism. And of course, no course can uh, comprehend or cover all the theories that were proposed in this field. That's why we are going to focus on the most important theories that appeared and the the well-defined and well-established movements and schools in this regard. Uh, that's why please uh, follow up. And today we will talk about the genesis, the foundation of literary criticism. What does it mean and why liter literary criticism? So uh, let's start with the definition of literary criticism. What is literary criticism? That might be a very simple, forward, naive question, but it shows the nature of the school. It shows what's going on behind the veil. It shows the cornerstone of this uh, field of humanity, which is of great importance to start with. So, uh, a literary critic or literary criticism, it is a disciplined activity that attempts to, number one, describe Number two, study. Number three, analyze. Number four, justify. Number five, interpret. Number six, evaluate a work of art. So, uh, we have six primary important points in, in the definition of literary criticism. These are the main functions, the main words, jobs of, of a literary critic. This is what he should do. What, this is what we expect from a literary critic while he uh, reads a literary text, while he gives his definitions and, and uh, interpretation of a text. So, in the beginning, a literary critic uh, starts with describing a literary text. That's number one. That's the, the, the first step of the way. That's the first step of the long journey of literary criticism. We start with the description of a literary text. Then we describe the nature of the text, we describe uh, the, the historical context of the text, we describe its, its cultural backgrounds of the text. We only describe what's, what's there in the text. Number two, we move on to study uh, those backgrounds, those historical, cultural, social, religious contexts of the text. We move on to further study and and unlayer those contexts and to de you know dig deep and then within that field of study so after description we start to study those fields those layers those uh, contexts in in a text then we move on to become more professional we we challenge our abilities to go further to analyze those historical backgrounds, those contexts, that text, the nature of the text. We try to analyze and to find out what is beyond that text. Then we move on to justify. Uh, that's why, for example, the author has written in that specific way, why he uses that specific type of style, why this is the style of the text, why this is the nature of the text. We start to justify. Then we move on to interpret to give meaning of, of the text, we move on to, you know, uh, to, to find meaning for the symbolic words, for those allusions, for those references in the text. We try to interpret what's behind, beyond the text. We try to understand the meaning of the text and, and uh, what the author wanted to convey, what messages he implied in the text. And finally, we evaluate the text, whether the text is a good text or not, according to those foundations that we have built. Of course, that evaluation that a text is a good or not good, it doesn't come just out of the blue. We should build a very solid uh, ground upon which we can build our evaluation of a text, because evaluation comes in the, in the most advanced and professional stage in the, in the journey of literary criticism. That's why we should never build our evaluations upon biased or subjective grounds. 
we should be as objective as possible of course it's an impossible mission it's mission impossible but we should try our best we should present our theories our ideas our opinions that's uh, why this is our evaluation of course uh, that journey goes through the first five steps then the last important step evaluation comes in the on the scene so these six uh, levels are the main nature or the main uh, levels of a literary criticism that journey that long professional a uh, challenging journey when we read the text uh, the next thing that how many literary theories do we have of course we cannot confine uh, the theories of a literary criti criticism because uh, literary critics mostly depend on some some fields beyond literature itself uh, literary critics go into the philosophical fields, they go into so, uh, sociology, they, they found their theories in historical theories, in historical fields. So they j never stay at that, uh, at, at that literary field. They always try to find different manifestations, different understanding of a text. They try to have a 3D or a panoramic view towards the text. That panoramic view does not come from one stance in literature, does not come from one, one opinion, from one perspective in literature. That's why uh, a literary critic should dive deep in different humanities uh, to, to find his theories. So, because anyone who responds to a text is already a practicing literary critic, and because practical criticism is rooted in the reader's preconditions and expectations when actually reading a text, every reader espouses some kind of literary theory. Each reader's theory may be conscious or unconscious, whole or partial, informed or ill-informed, eclectic or unified, an incomplete unconscious and therefore unclear literary theory more frequently than not leads to illogical, unsound and haphazard interpretations. On the other hand, a well-defined, logical and, cl and clearly articulated theory enables readers to develop a method by which to establish principles that enable them to justify, order and clarify their own appraisals of a text in a consistent manner. So, uh, according to this text, according to this answer, we cannot, we can never say that we have this, for example, package of literary theories. We cannot say that we have borders, we have limits to, to, to the world of literary theories. That's why uh, everybody can propose his own theory. Uh, everybody can propose his own vision and perspective toward, towards a text and his own interpretation and evaluation into the text, which can be considered sometimes as a theory. But of course, we are smart enough or clever enough to diagnose uh, those pitfalls or the weak points in a theory. That's why we cannot always say that people's ideas or people's evaluations and interpretations are really literary theory, are solid literary theories. Uh, we have a set, a system of theories, we have a set of well-defined uh, theories in literary criticism, uh, which of course build or, or provide us with a, with a solid ground upon which we can build our evaluations and interpretations. For example, we need certain schools to follow up. We need certain theories and ideas. We need a grand narrative to follow in order to, to build our evaluations. We cannot just make subjective uh, judgments. We cannot propose subjective visions or perspectives because they will not make sense. Uh, that's one of my main problems with my students in, in a literary course. Uh, I really want them to depend on a solid, uh, well-known literary school. Otherwise, only a, a straightforward, stupid, you know, uh, thematic analysis of a text will lead to catastrophic conclusions. We will not have that perfect, you know, um, 
logical, objective interpretation of the text. We will always have an incomplete, unconscious, and unclear conclusions when it comes to the text. We need to depend on well-defined, logical, and clearly articulated theories. Like, like for example, just an example. As an example, we have the perfect, you know, psychoanalysis school of Freud, Lacan, Jung, and other critics. We can depend on the on Marxism, Marxist literary theory. We can depend on reader response theories. There are a number of perfect, well-defined, well-established literary schools upon which we can depend in order to to propose our our. Uh, understandings of a text. So, uh, the next question that we might ask, do we have an innocent, neutral reading of a text? Just, just to be straight and forward, of course not. We can never have an innocent, neutral reading of a text. Uh, because, because every reader, every critic, is born or, or, or has lived in a certain culture. And any culture is a type of ideology. Ideology that blinds you from seeing the ultimate, the, the ultimate truth in the world. A culture as an ideology always blinds you or, or puts, puts obstacles in your way to reach that ultimate truth. We always can, are, are, you know, we cannot reach that destination, the ultimate destination of truth. We are always subjective in our readings of the text. We are always subjective in our readings of the world. Uh, that's why it is impossible to have that innocent reading. We are always subjective. We are always uh, biased. And, and uh, we always side with a certain ideology. Because we are born within ideologies. We are surrounded by ideologies. By, by cultural forces. By, by, by cultural implications. That's why we can never give an, an innocent, neutral reading of a text. Uh, according to the text or read or answer put here, a well-articulated literary theory also assumes that an innocent reading of a text or a sheerly emotional or spontaneous reaction to a work does not exist. Because literary theory questions the assumptions, beliefs, and feelings of readers asking why they respond to a text in a certain way. Moreover, a simple emotional or intuitive response to a text does not explain the underlying factors that cause such a reaction. What elicits that response or how the reader constructs meaning through or with the text is what matters. So, as, as uh, the answer provided here, of course we cannot have that innocent reading of a text. Because uh, a literary critic or a literary theory always questions uh, why the readers have that specific type of reaction. Why uh, a, a reader has that specific type of, of feelings toward the text. Uh, and of course, uh, we as critics, we uh, as readers, when we read the text, when we try to propose our evaluations or interpretation of a text, uh, one of the main problems or mistakes, fatal mistakes that we commit while we propose our ideas or perspectives is that we always empathize with the text. We become merged, we become one with, with the text. We, we put forward our emotions and our subjective perspectives in front of us. For example, uh, when we confront an emotional scene in a play or in a movie or in a story, we, we, we confine, we jail or bind our logical thinking, our logical calculations. According to Terry Eagleton, the great Marxist critic, he believes that one of the fatal problems is that when we empathize with the literary work, once that happens, we cannot think logically, we cannot uh, propose objective ideas about the text. That's uh, the fatal problem that we sometimes do. That's why the first thing we should do is that we should suspend uh, our emotional feels and responses. We should try to be as objective as possible. We should try to depend 
unwell-defined, well-established literary schools in order to propose some some rational, uh, logical calculations and evaluations of a text. So, uh, thank you very much. So far, we investigated these three important questions, and uh, we will further explain and investigate various and different literary theories. So, thank you very much for watching. Stay tuned. Bye-bye.